For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. Today on the Bitcoin Group, we'd like to welcome Davi Barker from Bitcoin Not Bombs, Derek J. Freeman from Peace News Now, and Will Pangman from Mass Appeal. Attention major corporations, have you ever dreamed about owning your own altcoin? Perhaps it could be used for coupons or a reward program or just to enhance the stature of your business. Get your own altcoin today at alphaliontechnologies.com. Screen share. Issue one. Bitcoin before the Senate Committee on Fatherland, er, Homeland Security. The first half was all about control, with representatives from FinCEN and the Secret Service. The second half featured representatives from the Bitcoin Foundation, a few businessmen, and a representative from the Child Endangerment Council. Does Congress really understand Bitcoin enough to regulate it? I ask you, Davi Barker. No. <laughs> I mean, based on... I don't know if you watch this hearing, but no, they don't understand what it is or how to regulate it. Uh, one of the things they do understand, and I was very heartened to hear this, is they understand if they try to regulate it, they're going to push businesses out of the country and the United States will fall behind in the Bitcoin market. And I'm glad that they're afraid of that because maybe they'll keep their hands off of it. But no, the, the, even the woman from FinCEN, you would think that if you were there speaking on a subject and you were supposed to be the representative of the expertise from the government on that particular subject that you would know what you were talking about. But but no, no, they don't know what they're talking about. Derek J. There may already be tax implications for Bitcoin. Uh, for all we know, Congress will treat Bitcoin like any other commodity that's traded on the stock market and uh, payroll or, uh, certain income taxes will apply. Will? Yeah, it's clear they don't understand uh, understand Bitcoin or, you know, if, if they did, they'd probably realize that um, there'd be great difficulty in regulating it. The thing that clued me in the most was, um, as Davi mentioned, the woman from FinCEN indicating that, um, you know, they, you know, they're trying to toe the line. Hopefully, the senators and 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 the woman from FinCEN kept articulating if they if they can toe the line between smart regulation and um, innovation, fostering innovation, then you know they'll have um, they'll have hit the mark. But um, I think if you understand Bitcoin and its disruptive nature, you realize that. Um, any amount of regulation that we're used to seeing out of Washington, D.C. is definitely going to stifle innovation and certainly chase uh, innovation, you know, entrepreneurs and new, new products overseas to more friendly jurisdictions. Uh, I thought it was really, really interesting that the woman from FinCEN, I don't know who she was trying to convince, but she kept trying to say that, oh, they'll, that uh, benefit of leaving the United States to uh, pursue your your new companies, your new businesses, will be short-lived um, because regulations will catch up over there. And um, yeah, I'm not sure who she was trying to convince. She certainly sounded like she was trying to convince entrepreneurs, but um, I think they're far too smart for that. Um, so who else was she trying to convince? Herself or maybe the Senate delegation at the committee hearing? I'm not sure. Maybe just the public audience on C-SPAN? I have no clue but uh, wasn't going to be convincing of any entrepreneurs, I'm sure of that. That was a really impressive moment. It really did seem up until then that she was convincing people to leave the United States so that they could get their Bitcoin freedom. I was watching it live with Davi and Derek, and Davi kept chipping in every time they said go to another country with more freedom when they said less regulation. It was really right on the money. What do you think, Davi? I, I think what's what's really missing in the whole discussion, at least what was bought, brought forward in the hearing, was that the government has no role in innovation. There There is nothing that the government can do to foster innovation. The innovation is already happening. It's happening right now in real time. 
and they're reacting to it because they're afraid of it. The only, the only role that the government has is to stifle innovation. The only interest that they have in what's going on is that they're not getting what they see as their cut. So the idea that the government is going to foster innovation is completely absurd. Zavi's exactly right. This whole hearing wasn't about um, Congress learning how to regulate, but they were licking their chops to see how they could get more, uh, take more tax money. They won't be able to regulate businesses because, no, they don't understand it well enough, but certainly the IRS is going to take their part. I was shocked that they weren't a part of the hearings. I was also surprised at how little the representatives seemed to know about Bitcoin. If I had a checklist to make for the representatives next time, I would say I'd like them to buy a Bitcoin, buy a product with a Bitcoin, send part of a Bitcoin to a friend, and maybe even donate part of a Bitcoin to a charity or a relief organization. I'd like the congressman to really know, they don't have to know the math, right? The math is complicated, it gets confusing at the blockchain level, but they could learn how to use Coinbase or blockchain.info, and they could learn how to buy a Bitcoin they would really understand it a lot better and it would come through in the hearing if sure. they'd actually tried it. It's not very different from email. They also could have spent three minutes watching the informative video at weusecoins.com. I don't think they even did that much because all of the analogies that they made were to centralized currencies. They mentioned e-gold, they mentioned Liberty Reserve, they even mentioned Second Life. Like every example that they gave was an example of a centralized currency which makes me think that they don't know what they're dealing with. Moving on, exit question. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being extremely unlikely and 10 being absolute metaphysical certitude, will Congress tax Bitcoin? Davi Barker. Uh, 10. Congress will pass a bill attempting to tax Bitcoin. 1. People will not comply with that law. <laughs> Derek J. 10. As I've said, they don't even need to introduce a new bill. Uh, it already is on the books. Yeah, 10. Um, the laws are already there. It's clear the attitude coming out of the hearings was, there, even from the FinCEN uh, representative, they don't need new rules at this point. They need to understand how Bitcoin fits into the existing rules, which I guess was a silver lining if you have one. The answer is 10. <laughs> <laughs> Issue 2, Bitcoin Hearing Part 2, The Revenge. This time, Bitcoin went before the Senate Banking Subcommittee, featuring the director of FinCEN again, and later joined by Bitcoiners and bankers. The bankers seemed heavily in favor of regulating the fledgling cryptocurrency, but Congress seemed reticent. Does Congress really have the patience to allow Bitcoin to grow, or will they clamp down with harsh regulations, forcing brain drain on the United States and promoting the idea of a Bitcoin utopia that exists somewhere else, where U.S. citizens will have to flee to find their Bitcoin freedom? I ask you, Derek J. Uh, yeah, they're, they're pushing people outside of the U.S., but it's not just through Bitcoin. Uh, the U.S. empire has been pushing people out uh, for decades. Uh, it's certainly with uh, the, the collapse that every, uh, f in the housing bubble recently, uh, people losing their houses, seeing opportunities elsewhere, uh, the growth in Asia, it's, it's forcing people out. Will? Yeah, um, there was a fascinating talk on Bitcoin from uh, uh, someone from Stanford University who discussed the, you know, the opportunity for exit and, and voice in entrepreneurship. And what he was really referring to is, you know, a, a, for lack of a better term, a democratization um, that doesn't include voting necessarily. So um, there's plenty of entrepreneurs I know personally and as acquaintances who've left in order to pursue um, a lighter regulatory climate. Um, just look at Disruptive things like Airbnb, Uber, and Lyft, they've had a heck of a time getting through some really arcane, um, you know, union structures and frameworks and just, you know, things that are outdated and ready. They're decaying and they're just being propped up with um, lipstick. So, um, you know, I've considered it myself, actually, for starting Bitcoin-related businesses or even non uh, bit, you know, non-Bitcoin-centric business ideas, but you know, including Bitcoin, of course, in them. 
Uh, I just don't see how a lot of uh, a lot of innovation is possible in America anymore. Davi Barker. So I don't see a whole lot of interest in Bitcoin among the sort of legacy banking bankers. Like it seems to me that they 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 don't have a lot to make from it, and it threatens their sort of business model. And so the people who really have their their voices in the ears of Congress when it comes to regulating financial matters, they don't have they don't have a stake in the game. So I think that we are going to see regulations because I mean the state's going to state. I mean it's a feature, right? It's not. It's, but but at the same time, um, Bitcoin users have already fled. So the idea that Bitcoiners are going to have to flee the U.S. to find their Bitcoin freedom, they have found their Bitcoin freedom by possessing Bitcoin. So I don't see a whole lot of need for the average user to geographically leave the country. Um, but there may, be, there may be use in that if you want a sort of brick-and-mortar location or you want to run a larger firm or you want, if you want to run a larger company, then you may need to protect yourself. But that's true for non-Bitcoin companies as well. So, I mean, there, there's not a whole lot to say about the geography of Bitcoin. I have to jump in and say, unlike most uh, tech companies in the U.S., which uh, enjoy not much regulation comparatively to the rest of uh, the U.S. economy, um, Bitcoin could be different in that the engineers who want to work on Bitcoin companies, uh, the, they need to be in places like India and China where these businesses are starting up. If they're not starting in the U.S. and you're someone who wants to be on the Bitcoin train as an engineer, you're going to move. That is a brain drain, and that's what we see at the end of all empires, the Chinese empire, the Soviet empire. There's always a brain drain of the best scientists and educators. That's what's going to happen here. But I can uh, telecommute to India. <laughs> oh, that's that's a good good point. But as an engineer, is that as practical as um, telecommuting as a commentator? No, I suppose not. <laughs> <laughs> One option would be uh, Galt Gulch in uh, Chile. I think Derek, you've uh, had some articles about that. Yeah, I I absolutely support um, individuals relocating, voting with their feet. That's one of the strongest votes you can cast in life is to move yourself to a place where you actually want to be um, and don't feel trapped by your geography. Um, you're, you're free to roam the whole earth and, and do that. Cer certainly uh, projects like the free, free State Project could be expanded to include Bitcoin and their freedoms and they could perhaps attract a new technological and financial crowd. Well, that's already happened. I mean, Lamasu Bitcoin is from the Free State Project, so... Exit question. What will happen first? Bitcoin at 1,000 or congressional regulation on Bitcoin? Davi. Um, if we're going to if we're going to include the idea that Bitcoin will will fit into current regulations, then I'll say current regulations will come first. Derek. Yeah, the, the, absolutely. Sorry, there there are already uh, laws on the books for this. Uh, will. Yeah, I think there are laws, um, but I think you know there will be some some new new rules, regulations coming out of Washington at some point. But I think we'll see a thousand before we hear the you know I keep calling it the answer from Washington. What will be Washington's answer to Bitcoin? Um, I think companies in America and worldwide even are waiting for that answer before they, you know, start um, putting their products out on the market. Absolutely correct. Bitcoin 1000 by January. This episode was also sponsored by Bitty-licious. 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 Get your Bitcoins today at Bitty-licious.com. Issue three, Bitcoin correction. Let's see. Next button. Bitcoin correction. After touching the heights of 800, Bitcoin fell all the way to 500 before popping up to 650. Is the crash over or will we see more of a downtrend? Why is there always such negativity in the Bitcoin community? When will we leave this ground floor behind and truly take Bitcoin to expansive heights? I ask you, Will Peng. Um, yeah, I guess what I saw was a lot of profit taking. I mean, I, I host a, a meetup in Milwaukee 
where I'm from, and we had a lot of new members last night at our meeting, and the chatter before we really started the formal portion of our, our the program for our meeting included a lot of folks talking about how they got out, you know, in time to take profit or, uh, you know, just before it went under their buy-in price or things like that. And these are, you know, new faces to not only our meetup group, but new people to Bitcoin, as we found out throughout the, the rest of the night, talking with each other and discussing, you know, all of the Bitcoin topics of the day, the week, you know, of recent time here. So, yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of profit-taking, in my opinion. I think, you know, again, we settled back in right uh, above, you know, right above the price that we saw um, the spike before Monday. So, um, yeah, I don't see that as terribly negative. I wish people would hold, but, um, yeah, I, uh, I see it. It's up. It's still up. Davi Barker. You know, the last, on the last episode, we were debating whether or not Bitcoin would stay over 300. So it seems a little strange to me to hear us now saying it crashed down to 500. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's all, it's all uphill from my perspective. You know, it, it went up to 100, it came back down to 500, now it's floating somewhere in the middle. It's a volatile currency, and, and we need to get used to that. Um, but this is the new normal. The new normal, it's not going back down to 300, okay? So um, I don't have a problem with it at all. Derek J. Uh, yeah, obviously, as we speak, the price is nearing 800 again, and uh, the the trend has. I mean, I can understand you asking the question because maybe a few hours ago it may have seemed like there was a downtrend, but as I look at the chart now, it really seems like a stronger uptrend than it was even a few days ago uh, when we had that huge run up. So. It, it's confusing, and the volatility is unlike anything I've ever seen. But uh, I, I expect it, like Davi said, to be a, a continuing uptick despite the rampant volatility. And I don't know what you mean by negative uh, negativity in the Bitcoin community. There's nothing negative about profit-taking. I can understand most people... Uh, who are getting into this now may have an investor mindset, and investors take profits at all-time highs. It just seems there's always this idea that it's going to go down to 250 and I'm going to buy back in or I'm going to buy back in after the next crash. There's always this waiting for the next crash feeling that I find negative. I mean maybe it's just crash bitcoins crash up and down. So That's not that's not negative, it's wishful thinking. People yes. want it to crash so they can buy more. Yes, I think what's negative is uh, you know, friends and family or or folks that we, you know, the four of us have probably evangelized to blowing up our cell phone um, after all-time highs and things like, why didn't you make me buy in then? And That's, uh, that's not you know, what happened. Despite my best efforts, friends and family, you said... <laughs> it's been rough. It's been rough. They, they don't listen. I had someone who, when they saw a headline that Bitcoin was at an all-time high, and this was when it was around 600 on its way up, and they said, I'm just calling everyone I know who has talked to me about Bitcoin to congratulate them. <laughs> there's, a, there's a certain idea that if you've heard of Bitcoin before this year, you must be wealthy. But right. I think a lot of people heard about Bitcoin, thought it was really cool, but didn't necessarily put their money in. Right? Uh, computer geeks aren't the best financial planners, is what I'd really think. It's not too late. It's not. Exit question. Pop quiz. This time next week, what is the price of Bitcoin? Davi Barker, go! I think we're due for some stability. I think it's going to hang out between seven and 800. Derek J. 900. Will Pengman. I agree with Davi. There will be some stability, um, unless we see some major news, um, like we did this morning, perhaps, about um, the topic we'll talk about next. But, um, yeah, I think we'll wiggle around between 850 and 900 for probably a week. The answer is 952. Issue 4, Bitcoin in outer space, 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 space. Billionaire Richard Branson is now offering Bitcoin as a truly intergalactic experience, a chance to spend their Bitcoins to go to space. Is Bitcoin truly the future of paid space travel? Is there anything more futuristic than being able to buy a ride into space with Bitcoin? Will Peng. Oh, man. 
yes, this was a dream of mine as a kid. I wanted to learn all about space and astronomy and astronauts and the shuttle and the rockets and everything as a real young kid when I was home lucky enough to be homeschooled for the first few years of my, you know, primary education. And um, gosh, there wasn't anything I loved more and, um, you know, never wanted to go to space camp, but always wanted to go to space. So, to the moon indeed. <laughs> Davi Barker. Uh, yeah, you know, I think what we're seeing is a shift in consciousness planet-wide, and people are reaching into the future, they're seeing what's there, and they're dragging it back to the present. And they're not waiting for the present to catch up with them. So commercial space travel is in the future, and he is bringing it to the present. Bitcoin is the currency of the future, and we are bringing it to the present. So at some point, those two vectors intersect, and we're able to buy commercial space travel for Bitcoin in the future. It's a no-brainer. Derek J. How soon can we do this? This is amazing. This is the best thing I've ever heard. Uh, can can we can we like do this right now? Is this available, or or do we have to wait for something? What what's does does Richard Branson's company send rockets up? My understanding they're, they're is that saying, they do. Well, they send a rocket that goes kind of to the top of the stratosphere. You go up into space for just a little bit. You float weightless. You can see the blackness. You can see the Earth, and then it goes back down. I don't think they've done their first official voyage yet. They've done several test flights, and I believe they have a guest list for the first voyage that includes celebrities like Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Okay. So, well, this has good. been done in Hollywood. The movie Apollo 13 was filmed in one of these sorts of expeditions, wasn't it? It might have been um, in an airplane where they go up and down. I yeah, mean, they do this weird... Curve, that's they experience weightlessness for like 30 seconds at a time. Yeah, that's more of that's just a jet that goes up and then comes straight down. This actually goes into the space, like the outer space. Oh, so it's like, like steady state weightlessness. Okay. Yeah, and it's a it's a you know it's an elliptical path. It goes up for just a little bit and then it comes back down. But obviously, this could be you know a lead to more space travel, more space tourism. It's a, the new word they've created to call this. How many Satoshis will it cost at the point where uh, it's available? Well, and certainly, like, will Satoshi himself be one of the first passengers? If you invented this thing, why not go into space? You've got plenty of Bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so then the question becomes, will Richard Branson protect the anonymity of Satoshi Nakamoto? In, included oh. on the first space flight were several actors, actresses, and some mathematicians. <laughs> oh. Nice. <laughs> Exit question. If you had the bitcoins, would you go to space? Seems like yes, or all around. So. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Can I stay there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Moving on to questions and answers. Hi. I love the show. Could you talk about forks? I'm not sure I understand what happens when a fork is created. How do I choose which Bitcoin to go with? Do you think the fact that forks can be created lowers the value of Bitcoin as a currency because not all Bitcoins will be the same? Regards, Zoltan. Well, Zoltan, I think we should first by starting to explain the idea of forks to a non-computer science audience. When you have an open source project like Bitcoin, what open source means is that the code that it takes to compile or to make Bitcoin can be edited. So if I wanted to rename Bitcoin to Mad Bitcoin, I could do it, then I could compile it, and then I could release it. But it would just be an exact copy. I think the fork that you're talking about is in our earlier issue about selfish mining. Selfish mining was an attack where miners could fork the Bitcoin, creating a separate copy maliciously, not as part of a project. A fork in computer science comes about when developers disagree on an open source project and take it two directions causing a fork. Let's see. Ivor Thomas writes, I set up wallets with two of my coworkers on break. They both have iPhones. The only decent looking wallet I could find is the blockchain wallet. I sent both of them 0 0.0023, 2.3 Ringos, about a dollar. My question is, what do you all think about the wallet in general? I installed it on my Nexus 4 last night and it seems feature rich, but I was unable to sweep in a private key from a paper wallet. This is something I had no problem doing with the Mycelium wallet. Anyone have any yeah. experience with the wallet software? Yeah, um, you know, we do this at our meetups. Um, we've been having a lot of new people come 
uh, the last several weeks. So the last activity we do before we sort of break up to the drink up portion of our meetings is um, make sure that anyone who doesn't own Bitcoin before arriving leaves with some Bitcoin. So we set them up with a mobile wallet solution right away because most folks don't carry their computers. But um, yeah, the blockchain wallet is, I think at this point, again, the only wallet available on iOS. Uh, Coinbase, if you had downloaded it while it was available uh, in the App Store for the two or three weeks that it was available, then you still have it. It's still functional. You can buy and sell Bitcoins. You can trade, send and receive. It's a very, you know, it's much more even feature rich than the blockchain wallet, I think. Um, the blockchain wallet, I, I'm a big fan of. That's the one I set up anybody with iOS because that's the only one at this point since Coinbase was taken down that's available. For Android, we set up almost everybody with Mycelium unless they request something else. It's so simple. Once you download it, it's ready to go. You already have your, um, your account already pre-created for you uh, through the Android um, device. So it's, um, it's a stable wallet. It's very simple. I've never tried to sweep a, a paper wallet using the blockchain app um, on my phone, but had no problem doing it through the browser, blockchain.info website. So, um, yeah, uh, blockchain.info is very stable. Every now and then there's some buggy things that go on with it, but nothing of great concern, and they really have great support, um, especially in the last, um, well, couple months maybe, that uh, uh, a free stater actually ha has kind of taken up that mantle. He's um, George Mandrick. He's, he's fantastic. You can find him on Reddit. You can find him on the blockchain support page and he will do a fantastic job of helping you with any help uh, support issue. Another nice thing about the blockchain wallet is that they email the wallet to you as well. So once you've linked your email account, you could recover your wallet that way. Yeah. One Another reason... wallet for iOS is a Glyph, G-L-I-P-H. It's also a secure texting and photo sending app. It can do blockchain or Coinbase if you're using a Coinbase wallet on iOS. One of the uh, reasons let's... that I recommend the blockchain wallet is because we are still seeing the schism between free marketeers and regulation beggars in the Bitcoin space. And I know that blockchain has great minds like Roger Ver and George Mandrick on their team. And so I anticipate that when harmful regulations come down the road, that they're going to be the one they're going to be the companies that make principled decisions about how to react to those regulations. And so I anticipate them being sort of more resilient and more sort of faithful to the sort of original pure intent of Bitcoin. On that note, I'd like to mention that I have freely available a quick video tutorial on how to set up a blockchain.info wallet on either your iPhone or an Android device over at bitcoin.peacenewsnow.com. Sure. I also propose Mandrick as an alternative lingo to Ringo. A Ringo, as everyone knows, is 0 0.0001. A See, thousand. I don't know that. I refer to that denomination as a Mandrick. Ringo is, of course, the Japanese word for apple, and Mandrick. also the famous Beatle drummer. Mandrick happens to be one of the pioneers in the Agris movement. He sells some great baklava, which was my first purchase in Bitcoin. So, <laughs> Some people well, I, call them Ringo slash Mandrakes. <laughs> I, I prefer the term Satoshi uh, because there's no uh, debate about Satoshis and you get to have more of them rather than it being a decimal, you would have 2,300 Satoshis. Yeah. Satoshi is a millionth, so if you have one Bitcoin, you have a million Satoshis. Or is it, it's a hundred million. I think right? it's a hundred million. Yeah, it's a hundred million. Yeah, the tiger million. is a millionth. I have all these terms on madbitcoins.com. I have flashcards I've made to help you learn them. The, um, we have They're a new question. Needed. Just go to Satoshi. <laughs> the first question, and this is a great question, what is the easiest way to create a paper wallet? So you could go to uh, securepaperwallets.com or a website like that. You can print out the paper wallet. Our friend Andreas has safepaperwallets.com. You can buy books of paper wallets. They're like checks. They have detachable stubs. That's cool. And basically, uh, what you do is you print the wallet. It has your public and private key. You send bitcoins to the public key. Then you can check online, see if they're there. Then you keep the private key safe in a safe, a security box, under your bed, something like that. 
Anyone else? Other places to create paper wallets? Like, I mean, yeah, you can like, info also has the info. possibility. Uh, Coinbase.com has a generator as well, and it's just like generating a wallet. And the, the neat thing is that your bitcoins stay for you in the blockchain. Your your paper wallet is just like a, a padlock that you have the key to that you just stick on the blockchain to come back for later. The next question: What will the price be at the end of the year? 2014. So that's a whole year past January when it turns a thousand. So Davi, what do you think? Uh, I'm gonna go ten grand. Whew. Derek? Yeah, that was that's my number as well. Uh, I'll go higher. I'll say eleven. <laughs> Will? <laughs> um, yeah, I think you know we've seen five hundred percent gains in uh, the first three years. I think it was an eight hundred percent gain um, in 2012. And so far, we have a 4,000% gain, I think, this year. So, wow, 20,000. Woo! I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Will be the top. I'm going to stick with Davi at $10,000. Let's see if we have any comments in Comment Tracker. Google is, of course, hiding the interface from me. It says, here we go. Uh, now do you need to dress properly to be on the show? And is that why Andreas is not with you? <laughs> <laughs> great comment, great comment. We did, we did shame Will into wearing a jacket. We you all know, had jackets, and then Davi and I shamed Derek into wearing a tie because we both had ties. I uh, object to the word shame. I did not say word one about a jacket or a tie. I think this is a perfect example of market regulation at work. When one person enters the marketplace and they see that there is an industry standard, there is an intrinsic pressure to adhere to that standard. <laughs> I concur with Davi. I didn't feel shame. I felt um, the need to uh, you know, be flexible and, for lack of a better word, conform for the next 30 minutes. So I was happy to wear a jacket today, guys. Well, I think you're all classing up the show. I think we look much richer now. And unfortunately, Andreas is in Greece, so he's unable to join us. He's on his Bitcoin world tour, and we hope he'll be back with us in a couple of weeks when he's back in the States. Let's see. Matt Evans is watching live. Hi, Matt. I what 11 was eagerly awaiting the Bitcoin group live. Hello, I what? I'm going to check the uh, questions in A. So we have no more there. I think we have no more. So we're going to move on to predictions. This is the part where I ask you to predict something, and I myself have forgotten to predict anything. So it's going to work great. Davi Barker, what would you like to predict about the future of Bitcoin? Uh, I'm predicting that Satoshi Nakamoto will out himself as Grover Norquist. Derek J. I'm predicting the first ever uneventful week in Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> that seems unlikely. Will, your prediction? Uh, well, my, my most popular prediction that I publicly share a lot is that by the end of this year, Bitcoin will reach 1,000. That was a fun prediction to share, you know, before four weeks ago. Um, gosh, I don't know. Um, I'll have to offer a prediction. Well, let's see. I think... Uh, we will see some innovation crushing regulation come out of Washington, D.C. Oh, the dark prediction, the dark <laughs> prediction. Nice work. I'm going to go back to the light side and we're going to say this is the Christmas of Bitcoin. Bitcoin will be given as gifts this year. It'll be bought as investments. It'll be talked about at the dinner table. Everybody is going to be on. Everybody else with a computer or a laptop about Bitcoin. Have they heard of it? Can they get some? Tell me more. We're out of time. Happen in my house. <laughs> We're out of time, but this episode is dedicated to John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the fallen president, the last free, the last freely elected president of the United States. We're out of time. Until next time. Bye bye. <laughs>